In the beginning, I would like to express my gratitude for giving me the chance to present my paper and my research here at Cultural Melting Pot International Conference in Wrocław. It is always a challenge to present, but I hope I will manage to point your attention towards an interesting, I am convinced of it, issue concerning the letter of the Romans. Egoimi Anergidaius. I am indeed a Jew born in Talsus or Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the pit of Gamalia, but according to the strictness of our father's law. This is what Paul states about himself, or at least what the author of the Acts of the Apostles, St. Luke, pulls into his mouth. He is a Jew. A anthropon Romayon kai atakatigon. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Says again Paul in the narration of the Acts. And further, I was born a citizen. He is a Roman. Moreover, he writes in Greek. He is accustomed with Greek language and culture, philosophy. You can learn this this time, not from the account of the Acts of the Apostles, but from the lecture of the Corpus Paulinum itself. For a prolific number of, for instance, stoic ideas on much. He is, in the terms of language, education, and cultural media, a Greek. But is he an Egyptian? And what do I mean by this title? In my paper, I will look closely at two examples from two books, the Book of the Bible, the Book of Wisdom, and the Book of the Letter of the Romans, in a juxtaposition, or rather, as I prefer to say, in a hypertextual relation. I will try to demonstrate that some of the ideas that you may find in the Letter of the Romans, Paul, could have drawn it not from somewhere else, but precisely from the pseudo-Solomonic writing created in Alexandria in Egypt. I am building my terminology uh, upon the works of French scholar Gérard Jeannette and his book Palimpsest, La littérature second degré, where by hypertextuality the scholar understands a deliberate use by the author of one text in the process of creating of another text, which involves not only the borrowing of some motifs, but often a close following of the sequence of the events of the earlier text. Hence, we can describe the, one of the texts as the hypotext, the text which is under, and the second as the hypotext, the text which, is, text which is above. In my PhD thesis, using Jeanette's terminology, I am putting forth hypothesis according to which the Letter of the Romans is a hypertext of the Book of Wisdom. As for the examples, uh, according to the letter uh, to uh, Longernecker, uh, American writer and commentator of the Letter of the Romans, I'm referring to his commentary from uh, 2016. Since the publication of his work, or the work of uh, Jonathan Gottfried Eichhorn in 1795, the question of the existence of textual parallels between the text of Romans 1, 18, 32, and Wisdom 13 and 14, has been by many scholars acknowledged and the case deemed closed. The reference goes to, to the famous text concerning the ability of man to achieve the knowledge of God from the observation of creation. The parallel is clearly, clearly seen. Uh, you have those on those uh, handouts, the underlying text where I put the, uh, the similar text. But is it necessary that Paul read the text of the Book of Wisdom? Is it widely acknowledged that the author of Wisdom reads philosophical texts and to those he refers in his writing? Couldn't the author of the, the Romans have the same texts in mind? Couldn't he understand, couldn't he be under the influence of Greek philosophy as well? with, for example, Platonic idea of the divine artisan. Or Paul might have reflected on Plato's pupil, Aristotle's work. Unfortunately for us, lost and preserved only fragments, the Philosophia. Or yet, concerning God's invisible attributes and his eternal power, of which we can read in Romans 1.20, Paul might have had in mind, once again, Plato's thought, as Cicero quotes him in the Natura Deorum. I have put all those uh, philosophical texts on the handouts at the end. But the philosophers went astray, at least Paul thinks this way. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Let us read as an example Cicero's De Natura Deorum and Aristotle's thought for the lost dialogue, the Philosophia. <coughs> Therefore, the word possesses virtue. Therefore, it is wise and consequently divine, having thus perceived the divinity of the world, we must also assign the same divinity to the stars, which are formed from the most mobile and purest part of the ether. The idea of natural God, knowledge of God, as systematic theology would call it, might have entered the text of the Book of Wisdom from the Greek philosophy. This is clear in the multicultural milieu of Alexandria, but from where they did directly did enter the letter to the Romans. 
from Greek philosophers, and hence Paul would be even more Greek, or from the Book of Wisdom, thus professing Paul an Egyptian. If we look closely at the text, we might observe that the crucial argument for hearing the resonance of Wisdom 13.14 and Romans 1.19 32, comes not only from the mere presence of the same idea of the natural knowledge of God, but most importantly from the critique of idolatry accompanying it. The two threads are joined together in a particular close and similar way, which stands here as an argument for the power between romance and wisdom. Please look at the, set, uh, the first set in the part A of the text. In both texts, there is to be found a judgment over those who did not come to know God, but started to worship creation instead. When the author of the Book of Wisdom writes, But yet for they, this the blame is less, for they have gone astray perhaps, though they seek God and wish to find him, the author of that, the Romans, accompany him by putting the judgment in a more strict and harsh words. They are without excuse. In both texts, the relation between idolatry and immorality is stressed. Idolatry is seen as a cause of the latter. For the source of wantonness is the devising of idols and their invention, a corruption of life. Writes Pseudo Solomon, while Paul does not fall behind and knows, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Furthermore, the immorality is advocated by a catalog of vices, a more extensive in the terms of volume in Wisdom 14, 23, 26, and shorter but no less gruesome term in Romans 1. 29.32, the second set of texts. I am suggesting that it is not the presence of the idea of Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, the ability to assume God by contemplating the universe that allows us to draw a connection between wisdom and romance. It is rather, on the one hand, the combination of two chief motives, the natural knowledge of God and condemnation of the idolatry, and on the other hand, the similarity mosaic of the precise thoughts and literary devices, as for example the catalog of vices employed in the same sequence that brings the texts closer to each other and everything with the same disclosure, exhibiting the foolishness and moral guilt of those who worship <coughs> the world and idols instead of true God, the Creator. Hence, although the primary idea of the natural knowledge of God is Greek, Paul seems to be rather an Egyptian, exploiting the Alexandrian Book of Wisdom in the terms of his influences. <coughs> the second example I have chosen to reflect on where I believe Pauline thought goes back to Egypt and the Alexandrian Book of Wisdom rather than any other place, consists of the use of the term hokrinon in Romans 2.1. In this case, it is not anymore a matter of discussion with pressing scholars, the echoes, influences, or hypertext revelation, depending on the terminology one will employ, of the use of hokrinon in Romans 2.1, have not been studied extensively. I think that there are many features connecting the texts and allowing the reader to just oppose them and uh, that the way Paul uses the term points out once more to Egypt and the Book of Wisdom. Precisely the first verse of the book. Among those features we may count first formal and lexical similarities to the text, as well as the context of Romans, coherent with the thought of wisdom, and secondly, what is an effect of literary analysis, the resemblance of the subjects, judging and being judged in both texts. As for the formal similarity, in both chapters, Wisdom 1 and Romans 2, the authors begin their text with the same literary figure, an apostrophe. Moreover, <coughs> when pointing out to lexical similarities, the subject of the apostrophe is identified alike. The ones to whom the author the, the author's addresses uh, are in uh, Romans 2 1 Pasphoclinon and Wisdom 1 1 Poiclinotes, those who judge, as you can translate it into English. The lexical similarity is observed. Though different in number, similar in Romans, plural in wisdom, the same word is employed, participant present activity in the nominative case of the verb krino. Can we speak here about the same addresses or only about the addresses named in the same way? Without denying the possibility of some differences, the word used in both places remains the same, which, is all, which allows drawing uh, lexical reference. Let us remain for the moment on the level of bare morphological similarities. I'm going to judge the matter in a more pale way shortly. Also, the context of the apostrophe in Romans 2.1 is coherent with the thought of the Book of Wisdom. Romans 2.1 has for its preceding context the text of Romans 1.18.32, with themes, uh, as has been noted above, natural knowledge of God, judgment over idolatry, and relation between immorality and the catalog of human vices. 
are similar to the ones discussed in the Book of Wisdom. Thus, one could argue that Paul, by placing his apostrophe, Dio Anapologetus Eia Anthropos Trinum, in the proximity of the themes considered extensively in the Book of Wisdom, tends to revoke, revoke in his reader's mind the similar apostrophe from the Wisdom, the Book of Wisdom 1.1. Those were only the formal lexical similarities as well, <coughs> as the indication of a coherent context between Romans 1 2 and the Book of Wisdom. They allow us, in my opinion, to read the text in a hypertextual relation, one as reworking of another. And here, within this, uh, uh, this, this reading, this hypertextual reading, another parallel emerges the synonymy of the subjects judge, judging and being judged. In the case of the rest of the Romans, uh, the judging subject seems to be fairly easy to identify. If we read Romans 2.1 in the context of the rest of the second chapter, Cochrinon would reveal itself as a Jew who judged the Gentiles. The majority of the commentaries follow this interpretation. Still, it seems important to me that Paul does not write about the addresses explicitly until the verse Romans 2.17. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God. Hence, it seems justified to think that at first the subjects hidden under Cochrino can, can include everyone, not only the Jews. Two, two other arguments enforce this thesis. Firstly, Paul employs a literary feature that allows to count everyone amongst the judges. He writes, Cantrope pas Cochrino, which can be correctly translated into English, omen whoever you are who judge. As for example, you think James the translation wants it. Secondly, the rhetoric of the whole Romans 2 leads to re the reader, the reader to an assumption that there is no big difference between Jew and Greek, to speak as Paul does, in the terms of rendering to each one according to his deeds, both the reward, eternal life, and punishment, <coughs> indignation and wrath. For there is no partiality with God, we read in Romans 2.11. Therefore, we may conclude that at first, Hoclinon, the one who judge, can be understood as referring to everyone, but later on, the author of the letter to Romans tends to associate him with the Jew who condemns. And here we come to the need of determination of the subject being judged. The subject being judged is defined by heteros, with the article. In Romans 2, the context, by trying in the presence of the opposition Jew-Greek, suggests that heteros would be the second group from the opposing parts of the pair Jew-Greek, or from the still clear in opposition groups of the righteous and the idolatrous. Is there <coughs> any similarity some hypertextual reworking between the text of Romans 2.1 and the text of Book of Wisdom? To answer this question, it is necessary to inquire what, or rather who, can be understood by Hoiklinon test and Gen from Wisdom 1.1. The subjects of the judging and the one who uh, is judged are not expressed explicitly from the very beginning of the text, and their determination requires and depends on the context and the knowledge of the reader. When trying to find a clue for the determination of the subjects hidden be behind the opinion on this in the text of the Book of Wisdom, I think it is possible to draw a connection with Wisdom 3.8. It's the second uh, set of texts from the example we did. We can connect the two verses, which seems justified. The, objection, uh, the object of the judgment from Wisdom 1.1, Hege, gains another characterization, Poetos. In this context of very possible meanings of the word Hege, we may suppose that the author understand, understood this term as mankind, which would be coherent with further narrowing of the object of judgment to Gentiles by Poetnos in Wisdom 3.8. This seemed to find a confirmation in the context of an extensive description of the judgment over the people of Egypt later in the Book of Wisdom. If the Gentiles are those who are judged, interpret the interpretation of Hoiklinontes as Jews seems to be the most probable one. As the reader can at first understood the term Hoiklinontes in an universalistic way, then he starts to read the Book of Wisdom he does not know yet. When he starts to read the Book of Wisdom, he does not know yet what will come in the subsequent chapters. But after he goes deeper in the text and in Otto's thought, he might observe that Hoiklinontes are to be associated with the Jews. The determination of the subjects brings to light more similarities between the text of the letter to the Romans and the Book of Wisdom. It is not only the polar parallel between uh, parallel form of the apostrophe, the same morphological uh, form with the difference in number, as I showed, uh, of the term used in both, uh, in both cases, the coherence of the context. The parallels goes as far 
as to the same subtle determination of the judging subjects and the objects of the judgment. Subtle as not evident from the very beginning. Only when the reader follows the subsequent parts of the text the understanding of changes and the judges are later on closely and more explicitly associated with the Jews. This time Paul wants more proofs to be an Egyptian in the terms of his influences. In his way of constructing the text of Romans, he is indeed very close to the thought of the author of the Book of Wisdom. Let me go back to the question from the beginning of my paper. Is Paul an Egyptian? Perhaps it was just a matter of rhetoric to say that he is. I wait to gain your attention. But if not an Egyptian, let me state that Paul seems to be a person having a deep liking in one of the Alexandrian writings, the Book of Wisdom, a writing which could be created only in a very particular milieu of a Hellenistic Jewish diaspora in Egypt, a writing which melted the Hellenistic and Jewish Egyptian, Jewish Alexandrian culture. And hence, I am stating that when it comes to the letter of the Romans, in a Pauline writing we can find a cultural melting not only of the Jewish, Greek and Roman elements, but Egyptian elements as well. Thank you very much. I do actually. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I was just wondering if you would go as far as calling Paul, because you said like he was kind of an Egyptian, would you go as far as saying that he was Gnostic? Because uh, there would be, uh, actually, Alan Page has wrote a book about Paul the Gnostic, and she's really convincing in putting forward some ideas, uh, comparing obviously the Nakhamadi Gnostic texts um, and the ideas in them with Paul's writings. Would you say that uh, this is the case, what we see here, or is it a bit of an exaggeration to say? I would absolutely not say this thing. Okay. Because uh, <coughs> when I'm saying that Paul is an Egyptian, I make those, uh, uh, those quotation marks, because uh, in this way I want to express the thing that Paul looks to the Egypt precisely to this writing of the Book of Wisdom. I'm convinced that Paul uses the Book of Wisdom and the Book of Wisdom is not a Gnostic at all. It is uh, fondly, uh, rooted, um, fondly rooted uh, in the context of uh, Hellenistic Alexandria, but this uh, Book of Wisdom is uh, from the beginning to the end very, very Jewish writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this way I want you to say that Paul uses the book, which is not Gnostic, He's an Egyptian as far as he uses some, uh, not some, this precise Egyptian writing in the letter, the Romans at least. Okay. Thank you. Did you find many, uh, any other um, Alexandria Jewish diaspora uh, um, writings that Paul is using also? Or you're just focusing on this one? Well, I'm focusing on the Book of Wisdom, but there are uh, many often some similarities uh, which are um, pointed towards Philo of Alexandria, for example. But uh, there are also some uh, commentaries which would say that Paul could have met uh, even the author of the Book of Wisdom, perhaps, because the date of the Book of Wisdom, the writing date, is not uh, very well established. Some tend to push the date uh, further more. And some say that it is the Philo of Alexandria who wrote the Book of Wisdom. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not looking to Philo, because this is another huge and uh, fascinating topic. <coughs> but uh, I would say that if the uh, Book of Wisdom has many connections with Philo's writing, if it's possible in the terms of date, then in this way Paul perhaps used uh, no. also other, um, other thoughts. If text, I would not uh, state so. Thank you. Thank you.